Okay, I think now would be a good time to get started. Um, so let just people continue filtering in. Um, but for those are, who are here, uh, hi and welcome uh, to another one of our spring uh, w water resource and search center uh, seminar series. And we're back on the topic of Red Hill. And this week have uh, Ernie Lau and Erwin Kawata who will be talking about um, the impacts on the Board of Water Supply. Um, so to introduce our speakers, uh, Ernie Lau was appointed on February 1st, uh, 2012 as the Board of Water Supply Manager and Chief Engineer. He's responsible for the overall strategic direction and management of the Board of Water Supply with a focus on expanding the department's mission to provide a safe, dependable, and affordable water supply now into the future. And Erwin Kawata is the BWS Program Administrator for the Water Quality Division. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers now. Uh, Ernie, please go ahead. Uh, aloha, everybody. Uh, er Ernie Lau for the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. I also have with me Mr. Erwin Kawata. <clears throat> uh, together, uh, both Erwin and I have been uh, tracking this uh, Red Hill, Navy Red Hill uh, fuel facility issue uh, for about eight years now. So our vision uh, for the Board of Water Supply is Kavai Ola, uh, water for life. Uh, we take this very serious because you know, the, the resources, the service that we provide, uh, really is important for our community's uh, health and well-being. Uh, and our mission to provide safe, dependable, and affordable water now into the future. Uh, we want to ensure that the uh, water systems that we operate are going to be uh, providing safe and dependable water service uh, uh, through all types of situations, including when the water system, the demand for water is at its highest, which is usually, usually during the summer months, we wanna make sure that the water system uh, can provide reliable water service to our, our community. This is a snapshot uh, of the infrastructure that it takes to serve 1 million people every day on, on Oahu with safe drinking water. Um, we have to be able to pump or produce about 145 million gallons a day on average. Uh, it, it, uh, it all originates with the ua or the rain falling on our vital watershed uh, lands uh, on the Ko'olau and Waianae Mountains. Uh, that helps to recharge the underground aquifer. We are 100% dependent on groundwater for our drinking water. Uh, so we have a, rare, a variety of sources that we uh, tap the uh, underground water in, in the aquifer from tunnels that uh, are dug at higher elevations that penetrate dike compartments uh, where water is uh, trapped there, fresh water is trapped there, and it flows out of the tunnel uh, and into the pipes serving our community without the need to pump uh, water or use any, uh, any forms of electricity. So uh, those are important tunnel sources for us. Uh, we also have shafts. Uh, like, for example, the Halava shaft, which actually uh, you basically dig a inclined or a slant uh, access tunnel all the way down until you hit the top of the aquifer, which what we call the water table. And then we dig a tunnel horizontally out in that ton uh, water table, uh, actually submerged in the water table itself. And from there, we, we draw water near the upper reaches of the underground aquifer and pump into our system. Uh, but most of our water sources come from wells uh, spread out throughout the islands. There are uh, over 90 different locations, 194 uh, groundwater well uh, pumps that we have in our system. Uh, and also, you know, we have to treat the water, unfortunately, in central Oahu. Uh, the lesson uh, there is, um, you know, past uh, large scale agriculture, uh, they left the legacy of uh, herb, uh, pesticide contamination um, that they used to uh, protect their crops uh, from uh, pests. And uh, that's uh, that residual uh, chemicals are still affecting our groundwater in the areas. And this is mainly in central Oahu, uh, Waipahu area, uh, where we have to filter it through large amounts of activated carbon uh, to make it safe to drink. Uh, but and then from there, it flows out to 171 water tanks. Actually, the numbers should be updated to 172. Uh, these water tanks actually store water. So we basically pump in effect from our wells and into these tanks. And from there, it distributes out to our customers. It helps to stabilize the water pressure, uh, but it also uh, stores water for peak demand periods during the day uh, for um, 
and also water for fire protection because the Honolulu Fire Department, uh, when they open up a fire hydrant, you're touching a board of water supply fire hydrant and there's almost 21,000 of those in our system. And the water that comes from it, it's from our system. Uh, so it's very important that we continue to maintain that uh, vital uh, public safety resource. We also serve customers at higher, at various elevations above sea level uh, around the island. You know, people that live on the top of ridges, uh, all the way down to the valleys, all the way down to near the shoreline. Uh, and overall in our water, this water system, we have a, what we call a hundred different uh, pressure zones that we serve uh, customers at. And, and water is conveyed to our customers, the 1 million people, uh, through 2,100 miles of water mains uh, spread out through, throughout the island, uh, with the largest being 42 inches in diameter. And at the end of the day, the million people are served through 170,000 metered uh, water accounts or services. Uh, and that's how we get water to our people uh, every day. Uh, we operate the system 24 seven. We have operators monitoring the system all the time. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately also we have main breaks almost on a daily basis. So this is a situation I, and I think a lot of people here are familiar with the Red Hill fuel tank situation uh, built between 1940 and 1943, uh, 20 underground storage tanks under the ridge at Red Hill uh, constructed in place, what we call field constructed. Uh, basically, they drilled a vertical shaft from uh, the top of the ridge down, and, and they then hollowed out a cavern uh, below the mountain uh, to construct the tanks, to make the space for the tanks. Each the, These tanks are massive, 250 feet tall, 100 feet in diameter, and can hold up to 12.5 million gallons of fuel. Uh, right now, and, and the bottoms of the tanks are connected by pipelines, large single-walled steel pipelines that run in a lower tunnel that goes all the way down to Pearl Harbor. So at Pearl Harbor, they would bring in ships, uh, tankers and barges uh, would ship uh, fuel and then pump it from Pearl Harbor inland and uphill to these uh, tanks uh, at Red Hill. I think it's almost three miles uh, distance. Connected to that same underground tunnel that carries the uh, fuel pipelines uh, it is also their drinking water source, which was constructed around the same time the uh, Red Hill facility was built. Um, it is actually accessed uh, through the same fuel pipeline tunnel. And the bottoms of the tanks, and, and I think everybody is familiar with this, are uh, right over our precious uh, sole source drinking water aquifer uh, and about 100 feet above it. Looking down at Halaba Valley here, uh, you can see the H3 freeway the Maunalua Freeway, these uh, two rows of black dots there, uh, 10 dots uh, represent 10 tanks uh, uh, in each row, so 20 dank tanks total. And about a half a mile away is their drinking water source called uh, Red Hill Shaft. Uh, they also have another source across Halava Valley called Aea Halava Shaft. Uh, to the northwest of the facility, we have four border water supply wells, our Halava Shaft, our Halava wells, Aea wells, and Aea gulch wells. And to the south, we have our BWS Moana Loa wells. Uh, we haven't detected fuel. We've been testing them um, from 2014 and have yet to detect any fuel contamination in these wells. But what's important to remember that under, under the surface of the land here is, is the underground aquifer. On one side of the, uh, that aquifer on the Red Hill side, is the Navy so, uh, drinking water source and also the fuel tanks. And the other side of the valley, a little less than a mile away is our Halava shaft and our other three wells, four wells in that area. Basically uh, drawing water from the same connected aquifer underground. So our concern is fuel leaks uh, that may emanate out of, emanate out of this facility uh, that gets into the aquifer below and flows with the groundwater. Could it flow across the valley and if we keep on pumping, could we inadvertently draw that contaminated water into our water system and serve it to our customers? And that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, the only way we can avoid that is, as circled in red here are three of the border water supply, uh, four wells on this side of the valley. Uh, they are shut down right now as a precaution. The Navy circled in yellow, those two water sources are shut down. We know that Red Hill Shaft was, 
uh, was heavily contaminated uh, and it may still be there. I haven't seen the data, but uh, back in December, Navy divers are going in there to try to uh, basically uh, soak up and remove whatever fuel they could uh, uh, collect from that, uh, from the, their drinking water source and uh, get it removed. So our challenge right now for the Board of Water Supply, the, the common thread that connects the Navy and the Board of Water Supply uh, is not the, necessarily their water system serving Joint Base Corps or Hickam. So the impacts uh, that was seen that started in late November of last year to the Joint Water System Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam is the Navy's water system. Separate from that is the Board of Water Supply. We did not have fuel contamination enter our system, but the common thread that connects both of us is that we we tap the same groundwater resources in this region, and we have wells that pump out of it. Uh, with the the need to take the uh, the cautionary uh, approach the based on the precautionary principle here, we've shut down three wells to avoid inadvertently drawing contaminated water from the underground aquifer that might have migrated across the valley uh, and put it into our system. Halava shaft represents around 20% of our supply. Halava wells and IA wells, about 50% of the supply. So our challenge going into, especially during the summer, we know that water demand really is affected by uh, weather conditions. Uh, and when it's hot and dry in the summer, that's when our demand for water from our customers increases to its highest. Uh, a lot of it is driven by outdoor uses, uh, such as irrigation demand. Uh, and that's what our, our challenge is gonna be during that stress period during the summer when the system uh, requires more the highest amounts of water each day, uh, the reliability of our water system to uh, continue to provide service to our customers. And for uh, Halava IA, uh, it's actually 50% of the supply. So they, I, of the two water systems, the smaller uh, Aie Halava system is, is uh, the most impacted at 50% of its supply no longer available. Uh, so this is looking at water use uh, uh, in the smaller Aie Halava system, which serves about, we think about 20,000 residents there. Uh, but it also includes Perward Shopping Center and Polymomi Hospital. Uh, the units on the left, the vertical axis is MGD or million gallons per day. The orange line represents how much we have to pump each day uh, to meet that demand. And you can see it really fluctuates. Uh, normally, and time is the scale on the bottom on the x-axis. Um, so if you look at it, it goes uh, from January of 2021 all the way up to April of 2022. Uh, you can see that during the normally during the winter or spring spring months when there's more rain that water demand is lower, uh, but as we enter the to the hot dry summers, we can see that uh, that's when we start to exceed this red line. Uh, this red line represents what we call the uh, uh, the Q95 of max day. Uh, basically, 95% uh, of the max day. Historically, that we've seen for max day conditions, which occur when uh, days of maximum demand during the summers, we've seen it uh, on Q95 being around 4 million gallons a day. Uh, you can see in 2021, which was a much wetter year than, uh, than we're in right now, uh, that the demand actually exceeded the 4 MGD uh, rate. The average da daily water demand is around three and a half. So the max day is about four. The, Average day is about three and a half. And I'm sorry, the, I skipped over this. These blue lines represent the pipelines of that Aia Halava water system. Uh, stretching from on the west, uh, east, uh, Eva Anna Street area, Halava Industrial Park, all the way to the west, so Kekaha Street, Waimalu Stream area. Uh, and here's the uh, Pearl Country Club golf course. This is the Honolulu water system. Uh, it's a much larger water system. We think it might serve around 400,000 people here. Uh, includes our, our major business center, the Honolulu downtown area, the center of business for the state, state of Hawaii, actually. Uh, a number of major hospitals in the system, like Queens, uh, Straub, Kapiolani, uh, Kuokini Hospital. Uh, they're all located and served by this water system. 
Uh, it also includes uh, our major university, including this campus, University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, and also uh, Kapiolani uh, Community College. And, and this part, what's shown in blue, is, which is the pipelines that stretch across the system, very interconnected grid of pipelines that stretch all the way out to East Honolulu uh, to Hawaii Kai area. Um, there, we do have uh, water systems that serve higher elevations and into the valleys like uh, Kalihi, Nuuanu, uh, Manoa, uh, Palolo. Uh, that's not shown here, uh, but the slow service system is pretty much more the Makai areas uh, at lower elevation, Makai of the freeway. Mauka of the freeway, we also have a connected high service system. So this, this system right now is uh, shown here as a low service system. A lava shaft is normally the, a water source that pumps into ser serving the needs of urban Honolulu. So you can see some wells that are located in Honolulu, like Kali Pump Station, Baritania, Wilder, and Kaimuki. When Honolulu was first developed, the well sources within Honolulu ke could keep up with the demand for water. But as Honolulu grew, it basically, we needed to find water uh, from outside of Honolulu and bring it into Honolulu, Honolulu to meet its demand and we headed out toward the Pearl Harbor Aquifer. We headed west. So we have uh, wells uh, that are not even shown here, like Pununani wells, Kalawao wells, Waiao, uh, Waiao wells, uh, that are also supplying water uh, to urban Honolulu. So imagine if we pumped fuel contaminated water, not uh, intentionally, but inadvertently, because contamination had migrated somehow across Halawa Valley uh, from the Red Hill fuel facility, from their leaks and gotten into our halaba shaft and pumped into this network of pipes, we would have a terrible, terrible time uh, trying to clean it up. Uh, and the impact could be any, to customers anywhere in the system uh, because that halaba shaft water could even make its way into East Honolulu. This is the water demand for urban Honolulu. How much we have to produce every day to meet the demands of the the businesses, the government agencies, and the people that reside in the city. Uh, you can see from the left um, y-axis, the numbers are much larger than, and, uh, than Aea Halawa. Uh, the historical max day is 74 million gallons a day. Uh, the average is around 65 million gallons a day here. Uh, but you can see for 2021, we didn't even get to the historical 74 million gallons a day. Uh, although this year it is much drier uh, than last year. Uh, one, maybe one way to look at it, because this includes uh, portions of 2022. If you look at January to about uh, April of 2021, you can see that it, it barely reached 60 million gallons a day here. Got over that just briefly in early April, uh, April 2nd. Now look to the year 2021 from uh, January so January, yes, yeah, started out pretty good. Uh, nor we had pr pretty close to normal rainfall in January, but we saw that February and, and March uh, really um, the, uh, became so dry, uh, maybe half of normal rainfall. And you can see that the water demand here on the right side of the graph for the uh, months in, in uh, 2022 actually started to climb at a much steeper rate. And, right, and, and it reached as high as over 65 MGD uh, with recent rains and our request for water conservation, it looks like it's you know, taken effect and helped to bring the demand down. But the overall upward trend is a concern for us. So now with the closure of Halava Shaft um, for the Honolulu water system, this is an example. We basically transferred the pumping load uh, to produce water to meet the demand of our customers to other wells in the system. And we have a number of wells that feed into the Honolulu water system. Uh, one of them is our, our Baritania wells here, right where, where my office is located. Uh, you can see that from uh, around the end of November, uh, we started to pump more water out of Baritania to make up for the lost capacity at Halaba. And you, you can see shown in the blue line as we increase that. Uh, we also on this graph track the uh, saltiness of the water as measured as chlorides and parts per million. So as we increase the pumping rate, 
from the end of November uh, all, all the way to early March, we saw the, the saltiness of the water and the water start to get saltier from the underground aquifer. Uh, and remember very simplistically, it's fresh water floating on salt water in the cracks and crevices of the lava rock of the aquifer. Uh, at this site, we also serve the high service system, the areas Malka of the freeway, uh, and we increase pumping into the high service. Uh, and we can see there, um, we saw a much more pronounced and larger rise in the chloride levels of the water that we are serving our customers up to, uh, I think, over 220 parts per million. Um, what we want to do is stay uh, below 250 parts per million. Uh, and, and typically, we want to try to keep our sources at 160 or lower. But you can see it rose up rapidly. When we cut back in pumping, uh, we basically saw a, the water become fresher. So we didn't want to stress the aquifer to a point where it could cause a long-term or even permanent damage to the aquifer at this location. We have to moderate how much we pump uh, to maintain the quality of the water coming out of the aquifer. Uh, so what happened here in Britannia, I think we were pumping after Halava Shaf was shut down, we, were, we increased pumping to around 13 million gallons a day uh, from this location. Uh, with the drop now, we're pumping about 7 million gallons a day, and we see the improvement in water quality. And that's probably a, as much as we can stress it. So that also causes us to address, adjust how much we're pumping from other wells that feed into our system and increase the, the burden on those wells to make up the water that we don't have here. So some of the critical projects that we're looking at in response to the Red Hill situation is immediately uh, go out and try to develop five to six uh, exploratory wells in the Waimalu and possibly Mauka, Mauna Loa areas uh, to help uh, look at replacing some of, the, some of the capacity we lost with the shutdown of the three wells, Halava Shaft, Halava Wells, and Aiea Wells. And install additional Sentinel Monitor wells in Halava Valley to assist uh, in the efforts by the Navy, Department of Health and EPA to better understand what is happening underground uh, with the aquifer there and where fuel contamination might be moving per, perhaps across the valley. Uh, we're also looking at adjustments to our adjacent water systems to see if we can move water, excess capacity from other water systems uh, to make up for the loss of our, our three wells. Uh, Looking at going back to wells that we have not used for decades um, uh, because the water became too salty to, to use to see if it's uh, the aquifer is freshened up there and we can actually uh, start to get a, a lower amount of water, uh, fresh water out of those locations. Test pumping in some existing wells like the Wailai Nui Valley well is uh, uh, located at uh, Malka of the Kahala Mall area, a small capacity well trying to see if it uh, how much it'll yield and can we uh, install a pump uh, uh, pump there to put it online. Complete repairs at our Kali pump station. Uh, like I showed earlier, Kali, uh, Baritania, uh, Kamiki are very old, large pumping stations, especially uh, Baritania and Kamiki. And I think they're, uh, I know Baritania is over 100 years old. Uh, Kali is probably in that range. Uh, also trying to complete and put back in service three wells uh, at Kalawa Wells that were down for repair. These uh, facilities were under repair before the Red Hill crisis occurred. And normally with enough redundant capacity in the system like at a Halava shaft, which is, can pump anywhere between 10 to 14 MGD, uh, that gives us enough redundancy to allow us to take other wells out of service and still be able to meet the peak summer demands uh, without affecting the service to our customers and also not affecting uh, the ability for a new, uh, new projects to get water meters and, and uh, get served. Uh, some of the longer term projects is a well field at Eva Shaft, wells in Kunia, Waikeli Gulches in Waipahu, uh, Wailele wells a well on the windward side uh, of Oahu. Also, our seawater desalination project, which is currently in procurement to build a, um, a 1.7 MGD uh, seawater desalination plant in uh, Campbell Industrial Park uh, with the ability to expand up to 5 MGD 
or 5 million gallons per day. Uh, that plan is uh, targeted if we're successful uh, in this procurement and, and go through the design of the pilot testing uh, design and construction. Uh, we're looking at getting it online and in service in early 2025. Uh, and I'll turn it at this point over to Erwin to talk about some of the exploratory wells and, and uh, uh, go ahead, Erwin. Yeah, thank you, Ernie. Okay, so this slide uh, just simply shows the locations of um, uh, where we plan to put exploratory wells. They're all at our existing um, Board of Water Supply Reservoir sites, such as IAF 497. Um, the purpose is, as stated earlier, is to find or identify new water uh, supplies to take the place of uh, the capacity loss from the shutdown of the wells affected by this uh, Red Hill situation. Um, all of them are undergoing uh, various stages of the permitting and the design and review process. Uh, so um, our hope is that we will be able to at least do at least one of these um, before the end of the year. Um, as, as in all cases, these are exploratory wells. Uh, we're gonna install a test pump to see if these locations can produce uh, water um, quantities of, uh, sustainably. Um, not all exploratory wells are successful, as um, many of you might know. We also are taking a look at a place to the very right of the slide, which is in Moanalua Valley. Um, after review of that particular location, we found it to be not very feasible. We are looking at other locations within that area to see if there are potentially, you know, an alternate better site that we can uh, explore and use there. Uh, next, please. Uh, this slide is, has, shows the locations in the red dots of uh, monitoring wells that we're going to plan to install. As um, most of you know, monitoring wells are essentially test wells for the purposes of collecting information from the uh, subsurface aquifer uh, in terms of water samples, as well as things like information such as water levels. Uh, as you can see, in relation to the Navy's existing monitor well shown in yellow dots there, we're going way beyond the property boundaries to kind of understand um, if we, there is any potential uh, uh, contamination that's moving away from the property. Uh, you can also see their locations in relation to our existing well shown in uh, that orange diamond shape there. Um, all of those are, you know, as far as these sites, uh, they're at the uh, animal quarantine station. We have one at the District Park and uh, one over at the uh, IA Elementary School. Um, back to you, Ernie. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ernie. Um, uh, so at this point, you know, we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the uh, procedures or the process. Uh, uh, should we uh, need to uh, uh, try to manage water use? Uh, so right now, because of the Red Hill situation, which has affected the aquifer, we know that. Uh, below the fuel tanks, uh, there is fuel contamination in the groundwater. We know that as far as uh, half a mile away at Red Hill Shaft, there's fuel contamination there. Uh, so the, uh, that's you know, caused us as a precaution uh, to avo avoid sending contaminated water into our system to shut down three wells. So that's put us into a shortage condition. Uh, we also could have a uh, issue of low groundwater. So Low groundwater is usually looking at the condition of the resource, basically the, measuring the top of the, of the underground aquifer and see how that those levels fall over time, uh, especially during year uh, when we get into drought conditions that could last multiple years. So some of the situations in the past, at least from I, what I remember uh, uh, having worked here in the Board of Water Supply long, long ago too is, uh, in the 80s, you know, we ran into a situation with water contamination, but also with multi-year drought. Um, and we actually implemented mandatory uh, restrictions on water use. I think it was outdoor uses at the time. And what, what we saw was a, a pretty rapid drop in water use um, island-wide. Uh, so that could be... Uh, so folks, I hope we're not also headed into that situation, which we would be... Uh, extremely terrible that we could be seeing the beginning of drought, uh, maybe multi-year drought. I hope that is not the case. I pray for rain every day. 
as I walk my dog. Uh, so our rules and regulations uh, provide us the legal authority to do, in our opinion, what is necessary uh, to implement special conservation measures to forestall water shortages, uh, to make sure that our customers have uh, a reliable water service. Uh, this is kind of the sequence uh, in a, our, our dealing with shortages. Uh, in the event here was the uh, issue of the contamination of the aquifer, the shutdown of Red Hill shaft. Our subsequent response also a shutdown of our three wells. Uh, we responded in, initially and we are still responding. And this is a very dynamic situation uh, to uh, move the, the load or the the, the need to make up that loss capacity to other wells. But we also need to watch very closely what's happening with the aquifer the, in the immediate area where the wells are located. And if the wells are starting to see elevated levels of chlorides or becoming more salty, uh, and then we have to back off and adjust and transfer uh, that load to other wells, existing wells in the system. Uh, we've been assessing the remaining source capacity uh, to meet the max day demand. Uh, uh, I think bottom line uh, with Honolulu, if we can get uh, wells, some wells at uh, Kali pump station and uh, Kalawao wells back in service as we get into the summer months, I think that will be in, have enough capacity uh, in Honolulu uh, to potentially make it through the, the peak demand periods of the max day in the summer. Uh, but the big variable out here that we have no control of is weather. Um, so. How, how the temperatures and the lack of rainfall, how that continues uh, in the summer, that's gonna drive water demand. Uh, so, you know, we are looking at potentially de declarations of water shortage. Ultimately, these uh, declarations uh, will be uh, before the board um, and they may include conditions uh, potentially that might uh, restrict water usage. Um, uh, but it'll be a, a process that we go before the water board and it'll be very transparent and uh, uh, there will be a public hearing held by the board uh, to seek input before making any decisions going forward. Um, and I wanna make it very clear, uh, we are not under a mandatory restriction on water, water use or mandatory water conservation at this time. And we don't have a development moratorium or a uh, limitation on new development getting water meters uh, from our system yet. We are evaluating the situation and it's gonna be an ongoing uh, constant evaluation of the system. Uh, monitoring pumpage, uh, the, the condition of the uh, underground aquifer and also weather, uh, rainfall primarily. Uh, we are have already uh, looking at reprioritizing our existing, our proposed CIP for fiscal year 2022-23. And, uh, and, you know, we are um, actually a fiscal year 23, so which goes into 24. Uh, looking at prioritizing uh, projects that relate to responding to the Red Hill situation as our, some of our highest priorities. Eventually, uh, hopefully someday, and this could be a few years until we can get the, uh, uh, take the actions necessary to make up for the lost supply uh, that we're going to be in the recovery stage and hopefully that will be a wet year where there's going to be a lot of rain that help will help to replenish the aquifer and rainfall uh, not only replenishes the aquifer but it immediately has an effect on water demand so people don't water their yards hopefully when it's raining so if any of you have a sprinkler system please turn it off if it rains the, the night before So these are kind of the water shortage conditions that we're looking at. Uh, and it's based on hours of operation of our pumping units, our well pumps. And there are some pumps that we are designated as standby or backup pumps uh, in case there, be, there is a breakdown. So normal conditions, we can meet the max day, the high day of high demand during the summer uh, and be only pumping at the most six, up to 16 hours a day. At the most, we can operate the pumps to meet the daily water needs of our customers in 20, 24 hours. Uh, so if, if we see that, uh, and, and it's general voluntary uh, conservation messaging going out, uh, if we see that uh, we're operating our pumps now closer to 20 hours, 
Um, and we actually now we've moved into targeted uh, conservation messaging like we have right now, um, then we're in the alert condition. Where it gets really uh, difficult and challenging is when now the pumps are running uh, almost continuously, not quite at 22 hours out of 24 hours. Uh, and at that time, you know, we're, we know that uh, demand might overtake uh, our supply. Uh, so that might be something that we might be considering at that point for uh, mandatory restrictions or mandatory water conservation measures. Uh, and, and, uh, and it progressively could even get to more terms on uh, uh, limitations on new water meters for development. But I want to be clear that we're not there yet. Uh, but out of the two water systems, the Aya Halava system is, is in, in a much more, much more challenged situation. So this is uh, out of our rules, also section 1-101, one uh, 1A. So extensions to the public and connections uh, to the public water systems, you know, will be approved by the department, the BWS, where pressure conditions permit uh, provided that the meters are within the service limit as if, except as provided under elevation agreements and the department has sufficient pressure and water supply available for domestic use and fire protection and can assume new or additional service without detriment to those presently being served. So this is kind of the balancing act uh, between uh, providing uh, safe and reliable water service uh, to our existing customers, but also accommodating the needs of, of the community to build affordable housing or do other uh, projects and, and bring on new construction that might increase the water demand on the water system. Uh, so it's kind of this delicate balance that we have to maintain. Uh, and if we get into the situation uh, here, uh, item number five, availability water for proposed developments. Category one is adequate water supply, no problems. Uh, new developments, uh, water is available. Uh, category two areas with limited additional supply. Normally, uh, and, and what you see here is that we don't we we don't actually issue advanced water commitments. So the when a developer writes in a, a letter to us, uh, and they do it often uh, very early in the project as part of their due diligence for their project uh, on entitlement issues on infrastructure capacity. Uh, we'll send a response back to the developer that might say uh, water is uh, not available uh, or water is available, uh, but the final determination will be at the time they come in for building permit. Uh, prior to November last year, our response was in the Honolulu Water First System as an example to inquiries, uh, questions about availability of water. Uh, what, it was a response basically that said that water is available. However, it final, final determination on that would be at the time of building permit. Uh, right now, because of the Red Hill uh, situation, we are disclosing to, uh, to people asking about the availability of water to, uh, to uh, cite the, the Red Hill situation that's affected our aquifer. Um, and also right now we're not saying we're not able to determine if water is available. It'll be determined at the time of building permit. Remember, we're kind of in this dynamic situation that we're, we monitor, we're monitoring uh, weather conditions that uh, correlate to increased water demand, our system capacity, the pumps that are running um, or pumps that are out of service uh, and also the condition of the aquifer. Uh, so we're going to make that determination at the, as, as before at the time of building permit. And in areas with no additional supply, um, uh, this says here that, you know, uh, existing lots that uh, don't have a meter can get a small meter from us. Um, so everybody has access to water. So in a moratorium, and these are some examples, of these bullets of uh, things that might, might occur. And again, I want, to, I want to reiterate to not create panic here. We're not here yet. Uh, but if we had to go here, these are some examples of potential actions or requirements. Uh, limit approvals to a single minimum size water meter for existing vacant lots. Uh, for pro projects uh, that are redeveloping an existing parcel, uh, perhaps look at limiting water demand uh, for the redevelopment to uh, existing water meters that serve that parcel, 
or uh, previous water allocations or, or use on that parcel prior to development. Um, and if they need more water, uh, some of the other options might be to do on-site reuse of water. Uh, look at such, such thing as uh, gray water re, uh, reuse, uh, stormwater catchment, uh, AC air conditioning condensate recovery, high efficiency plumbing fixtures. Um, and another, another thing, uh, uh, option might be uh, the no net gain in water use approach where a particular parcel where they wanna redevelop needs more water than what was used before in that parcel. Uh, but there are other older buildings in the uh, immediate area served by the same water system. So perhaps the developer could approach the owners of those buildings and, and implement a retrofit to from low, uh, low efficiency, high water using fixtures to high efficiency uh, uh, water efficient fixtures. And the net savings from that apply that to their particular project at a different location. So no net gain in water use. So sort of a water capacity neutral to, uh, to the water system. And these are, I just want to ca uh, caveat here, it is, uh, these are just some of the examples of our, our thoughts, and we are open to suggestions. And more, you know, more recently, you know, uh, we've been encouraged that uh, we've had uh, a lot of discussions with developers that some of them are really looking at this very seriously. And, uh, and uh, one developer approached us recently, I won't, I won't identify the developer, we're, we're still in discussions, uh, was looking at the approach of, uh, they want to build more units on their project, more than what already exists. Uh, and they want to look at how can they do that and use less water than the, pro uh, the, the, the project is currently using. So build more units using less water than already is being used. And we really applaud that. Uh, uh, I think that is really sustainable thinking. Uh, and that's where I think we all as a community need to start to uh, explore those options. Uh, you know, there is hope here um, that water conservation, we know water conservation works. Um, that, and this is looking at the metropolitan or the Honolulu water system over time from 2007 to 2021. Uh, you can see the average aid demand uh, has actually uh, gone down over time. But if you look around Honolulu, Honolulu from 2007 to 2021, I would say most of us would say that Honolulu has grown as a city, that there are bigger buildings, that the densities have increased. Um, and yet you see here, uh, the trend has been actually going downward. So we know that water conservation, improve uh, plumbing codes that require higher efficiency fixtures and water conservation by our existing customers, you know, can work here, uh, but it requires everybody to do their part. And this is a positive. So really, we're in a situation now uh, that if it, it would have been much worse if the water demand uh, for Honolulu was back here, uh, going over on average, sometimes on average, over 80 MGD. Uh, remember, we're looking at 74 MGD as the max day. Uh, and you know, so there, there's, there is hope. This, this proves, I think, that it is possible. In summary, uh, three wells are shut down in response to the contamination issue. Uh, they have a water use permit or, uh, for of about in total, I think a 13.5, but also they have a peak pump capacity, especially during the summer to produce uh, more, to pump more water from the aquifer for short durations of time to meet the like the max day conditions of 17.5. So 14 I mentioned uh, out of halava shaft and three and a half uh, combined from IA and Hanava Wells. Uh, we need to encourage and stand in support of our Department of Health and the EPA to require the Navy to safely defuel as quickly as they can, uh, take that fuel away from being right over our drinking water aquifer, because as long as it exists over our drinking water aquifer, it is a real and present danger to our water resources for further damage. Um, we, and I appreciate Secretary Austin's decision on documenting his March 7th memorandum, uh, but I'm also very uh, keenly aware that I want to see actually the implementation of what's in that memorandum uh, and the defueling and permanent shutdown of the Red Hill facility. 
Water conservation is going to be critically important uh, from our, our customers, and not only residential customers, but business customers uh, and government customers also. Uh, so we reached out. Uh, I personally, I think I've talked to 24, 24 of the largest water users uh, in, in these systems, uh, and we're continuing to reach out to them. Uh, water demand can't exceed the supply. That is the constraint here. Uh, or there could be water service disruptions that could take effect and take the form of lower water pressures. And perhaps at times when the reservoirs, the water tanks run dry and we can't refill them uh, over the course of the day, uh, that some people might actually not see any water for periods of time uh, during this, the year, especially during the summer. And I'll stop sharing uh, at this point and I'll be available for questions. Thank you so much for putting up with me. All right, uh, thank you so much for that excellent talk. Um, a lot of really important information. Um, so I'm going to do the, and the I'll just the Q&A now. Um, I'll do it in order of most up. Um, so the first one is from Paul Ayer. Um, he says, uh, the Navy's groundwater model has been rejected by both DOH and EPA because it does not adequately simulate the flow of water through the aquifer. Um, are you in a position or going to have the Navy resurrect the uh, border water supply 3D solute transport ground flow model prepared by Todd Engineering in 2005? Um, that model does a good job of simulating the flow and chloride concentration in groundwater from Honolulu to Waimalu. And that model provide the foundation for a more, more current model that addresses the concerns at Red Palava. Uh, hi, Paul. It's been a while. I know you, we talked just recently too about this. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, we, we'll take a look at that. I, I'm not familiar with the Todd model, which is uh, done by um, when Chester Lowe was here at the Board of Water Supply as the head of our hydrology geology branch. But uh, 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 Paul, I'll reach out to our hydrogeo branch to see if they're, uh, they can get access to the model. Uh, I'm not sure if they're familiar with how to, how to run the model. Uh, you know, the other, mo uh, so the, I'm glad the Department of Health and EPA rejected the Navy's model, which is, didn't seem to match the uh, uh, field data. Uh, that was collected and what's of it, what's known of the area. Okay, uh, the next question is from Christina Jedra. Um, Aloha, Christina Jedra with Civil Beat here. Uh, thank you for holding this event. I'm wondering about Board of Water Supply's reaction to DOH's news this week that the Red Hill contention appears to be stable and possibly contracting. Do you concur with that conclusion? I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> okay, hi, Christina. Um, I really don't know a lot about how how they're basing those findings are uh, on on you know what's the basis for that that uh, statement. I, I think I think there's a general consensus that there needs to be much more uh, thorough investigation and collection of data, uh, including drilling more monitor or test wells especially in the valley area to understand groundwater uh, movement and contamination movement and also the complex geology better. So, um, Christina, I, I, I can't say if I agree or disagree with them. I just don't know. Uh, next question from Rosie Aligato. Given climate projections, what options are being considered to manage demand in addition to encouraging conservation, for example, water reuse, stormwater recapture? Uh, you know, I, I've always thought that uh, stormwater recapture, you know, and that's, uh, that's something that is supported by the City Department of Facilities Maintenance, which is re responsible for the area of stormwater management. Uh, trying to retain that and reuse it on site really makes sense. Uh, water reuse, we, we really believe in that. Um, we are are going to look at expanding our, our recycled water facility, which takes treated uh, secondary treated wastewater at Honolulu Uli, and actually uh, produce more water for irrigation and also industrial use uh, from there. So, uh, as that's as the plant expands there to a greater capacity in secondary, 
we want to expand the use of uh, recycled uh, or reused water. Okay, uh, next from Cliff Foss. Uh, the recent spill was not the first in Red Hill facilities history. There are at least several previous fuel leaks. Good. So have there been any indications of fuel related contamination at potential downstream wells lava shaft? If not, would that make it seem safer this time? Uh, we, uh, like I said earlier, we've been testing, I, I, may, I thought I said it, that we've been testing our, our five closest wells, four on the Northwest and one on the South for about eight years. And we haven't uh, actually seen any fuel contamination yet. Uh, but we're concerned is that we don't know for sure that fuel contamination might not make it uh, to those uh, to those wells if we, especially if we turn on the pumps and start to hasten the migration across the valley. We just don't know. We can't take that risk. And Cliff, by the way, hi. Uh, I still remember taking the class at UH many many years ago, uh, and you were the professor there. Um, next is Lynn Bailey. Um, Sorry, under, Carrie, there's a different, um, there's a question by Sophie Cock that's got six upvotes. Okay. Um, I might, mine might not be uh, updated. Refreshing. Okay. Can, Can I read it yeah. for you? Okay. Yeah, go Hi. ahead. Hi, Sophie Cock with the Star Advertiser. Question for Ernie. Um, Senator Brian Schott said earlier today that the BWS could test a lava shaft daily to ensure the water is safe, suggesting that this could be a means for bringing the well back online. Is this feasible? As we saw with the Navy's test of its Red Hill shaft last year, it took weeks or months to get the results back. By the time the contamination hit, it was too late. Would BWS face a similar dilemma if it tried to restart a lava shaft as early as this summer with daily testing as a safeguard? Uh, you know, that is, that's very true. And uh, maybe I can ask Erin, uh, Erwin Kawata from our water quality division to uh, tell us about how long it takes to, from the time a sample is drawn from the source to the time we get actually the uh, analysis report from the laboratory. Yeah, the petroleum analysis takes about uh, four weeks to complete, three to four weeks to complete. So even if you took a sample on day one of a month, you still have to wait that uh, and you took another one on day two and day three, exact, uh, for example, you still have to wait that three to four weeks for the sample result collected on day one for you to get that. And in that time span, um, we could be incurring contamination and not know it until we receive that test result. So um, while it's, uh, you know, it's, it sounds like a, a feasible idea, um, it still takes, uh, a certain period of time to complete the analysis. So in the meantime, the uh, Halava shaft saver was pumping at 10 MGD and it was kept running uh, for 30 days. You know, that's a lot, of, uh, it's millions of gallons of potentially contaminated water that would have been into the water system serving 400,000 people. Uh, by the time we got the test results that told us we should have shut the pump down 30 days ago. I think the reality, or isn't it, Erwin, that the, it's it's it may be it's very difficult to get results back like overnight. Yeah, it is difficult because um, the method itself it has certain procedures, such as the extraction procedure. It takes 16 hours to do the extraction. So even if you could get it to the laboratory faster, or you were to sample it every day, you still have to go through that 16-hour extraction step to uh, on that sample that you collected. So like everything, there's a certain time period that you have to go through to complete this, each of the different steps in the analysis. Thank you. Okay, Aurora, who's next? Um, I think Kirkland. you're gonna have to moderate that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna be a Mine's not updating voice. the update for some reason. Heather, Heather Kirkering asks, do you have any influence over tourism members when our water levels are low or when in a conservation mode? Your second question is, is your expectation that the contaminated groundwater and wells will become usable in the future? So first question is about influence over tourism numbers. 
during conservation? Uh, okay, we, we don't have any influence over tourism numbers uh, coming to our island to, uh, to visit, uh, but we are, we recognize that. Uh, so we are actively reaching and engaging with the tourism industry uh, to look at how they can, uh, even the putting aside the tourists, the, these uh, hotels have a lot of properties that are large water users. Uh, so how do we make uh, working with the hotels to get them to be as water efficient as possible? And I think they are actively looking at that. Then also the other part of that is how do you educate the, the visitors that stay at these, uh, these destinations and actually uh, encourage them to, uh, to malama the resource, to, only, to not waste it. Uh, so we are actively engaging with them. And there is one hotel chain that I won't mention at this time because we're still in discussion that is totally willing to work with us. Uh, we are gonna be reaching also out to the Hawaii Tourism Authority and uh, doing a presentation like this with them and talking about uh, water conservation uh, with, for, for visitors. Uh, and there is an effort that uh, we're, we're working on with the Hawaii Community Foundation to look at how jointly work to work together to educate uh, visitors coming into our airports um, as they arrive. And the benefit of that, it'll also help ed educate local people that are traveling to and from the mainland or between the islands too. Okay, great. And her second question was, is your expectation that the contaminated groundwater in Wells will become usable in the future? I, I don't know. I, I wish I knew uh, if the, how long the uh, field contamination could reside there. Uh, there's a big question right now. Uh, we know through the administrative order and consent uh, discussions, uh, 72 documented releases were identified. I, I think uh, the volume might have been our, uh, over 180,000 gallons of fuel. And this is over the life of the facility, which is almost uh, 80 years old. So a really a large variety of different fuels uh, because you know the Navy's ships use different types of fuels back in World War II from what they use today. Uh, airplanes also use different types of fuels. So there's a variety of, a mixed bag of fuels stored there. Uh, Ern, you wanna add anything to a possible response uh, to that question? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ernie. Yeah, so as Ernie indicated, yeah, there, there is a, uh, a large number of uh, releases, 72 releases documented. There were, and in that uh, number of releases, the estimated volume is about 180,000 gallons. And so it had to go somewhere. And the thought is that it's in the Vedo zone or in the unsaturated rock underneath the, the tanks. And so is that a potential source of fuel that can be made available to the groundwater underneath the, the tanks that are next to the Vedo zone. And that's the concern we have is that it's a source of uh, potential contamination that could potentially get released uh, into that groundwater and then made available to move with the groundwater as it flows and dissolves. Okay. Okay. Um, there was a question that was missed from Lynn Bailey. Um, so, uh, do the Board of Water Supply and Navy share any distribution lines or systems or are the pipes completely separate? Okay, hi Lynn. Uh, okay, uh, we do have emergency connections to the Navy water system, which is more for the Board of Water Supply supplying backup water to the Navy or what we call emergency water. Uh, those, uh, those are all metered. Uh, and they also have uh, backflow prevention devices, except for one large uh, connection that is, uh, it, the valves are actually closed. So there are connections, but right now I think uh, all the connections to the Navy water systems are, have been secured, shut down. We did have one uh, going for a while uh, after the fuel contamination issue broke out uh, in late November, it was at Manana Housing. Uh, around the mid-November before the fuel crisis uh, situation happened, uh, we had already uh, temporarily supplied the Manana, Manana housing uh, uh, area of the military, which is near Pearl Highland Shopping Center uh, with temporary water service because they had a pump breakdown. Uh, 
uh, we've since uh, been able to shut that uh, that connection down. So all connections, I believe, right now are shut down. Okay, there's a question by Meredith Wilson. Has the Navy been able to locate where the fuel plume is located and generally moving? Is this even plausible? Every day the fuel remains in the tanks, the remediation of the aquifer delays. I, I don't know uh, the progress on that. You know, uh, we're not uh, privy to all the information. I, I noticed there are some people from the health department uh, on this meeting that might be able to uh, better respond to that. I do wanna acknowledge hopefully in the near future, we'll have a better understanding because uh, we have been invited uh, to participate in a smaller working group uh, that involves the, uh, we've been invited by the EPA and Department of Health. Uh, so we've agreed to uh, join that group uh, in the hopes that a, a good clear action plan can be developed and that we might be able to get better access to information. Um, I just wanna add uh, that there'll be a presentation on May 6th by some of DOH specialists. So some of these questions that might be appropriate, more appropriate at that time. Thank you, Aurora. Um, I'll make sure I register for that uh, meeting. Yeah, um, and that's for the public too. Um, so you could defer this, Question, this is from Gerardo Gonzalez. Can you briefly describe the current method for cleaning up the contaminated water from the Red Hill spill? Uh, I'm gonna ask her. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. That's probably a better question by the Department of Health. But from what we know, I'm gonna ask Erwin to uh, uh, share his, what he knows. Um, yeah, what, when um, the contamination event uh, happened, what we understand was the Navy spent uh, a number of days and weeks uh, flushing their pipeline system and the Navy's water system, as well as the, the homes with just uh, potable water. And that was a very long and lengthy process. Um, and as far as its ex um, effectiveness, um, certainly those uh, homes and the water system was um, deemed safe for use by the Department of Health after uh, a number of um, attempts to flush it and do some confirmation testing. So based on that experience, that's the um, only information that we have is to be able to gauge um, how you would remove um, petroleum contamination from the water system. Okay, uh, Carrie, I assume I'm just gonna sort of take over the Q&A, so. Yeah, that just, might be better since okay. um, mine is not uh, uh, updating correctly. Okay, so we'll just rotate out. Excuse me. Um, so the next question is from Hudson Slay, and they ask, is Board of Water Supply involved in advocating for and or developing more wastewater reuse uh, to reduce potable water use, especially for irrigation purposes? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we actually uh, uh, funded a study which we did uh, potentially a scalping or you know taking some of the wastewater from a large uh, wastewater line that runs through Alawai Golf Course, harvesting some of that wastewater, treating it, uh, treating it, and with the intent to try to reuse it for irrigation on the golf course, which uses potable water right now. Uh, and, and if it if it made sense, we really wanted to. Uh, try to work together with the uh, Department of Environmental Services and, and the Environmental Services Department, uh, I'm sorry, Department of Enterprise Services, which operates, owns and operates the golf course, ENV also, uh, and BWS to see if we can do that. But one of the challenges we found when we uh, surveyed the quality of the wastewater in that uh, sewer line is that <laughs> Uh, during times of low tide, yeah, the, the water was uh, suitable for irrigation uses, but at high tide, the salinity levels went so high, you couldn't use it for irrigation. Uh, so given the fact that we're facing sea level rise, uh, that situation probably would get worse over time. Uh, so that project, which is only a feasibility study, uh, we couldn't, we didn't proceed on it. Uh, but we want to look for more opportunities uh, for that. Uh, in working in partnership with uh, e and uh, Great, there's still 
many, many questions in the chat, so I'm, I, I'm the Q&A, so I'm, I'm trying to keep up. But um, then Bailey asks another question. And again, for the audience, please upvote um, questions you, you really want to hear answered. Um, Lynn Bailey asks, under what conditions might operations restart at the wells that are shut down due to the Red Hill release? Uh, you know, I've been asked that question many times, and a, a simple answer is one I'm absolutely sure if I turn on those wells, there's no chance that fuel tainted water will get into our water system to our customers. I mean, that's my answer. <laughs> that's all. Thanks, yeah. Aurora. Um, Jonathan Schroyer asks, understanding this is less of a PWS than a uh, Commission on Water Resource Management issue, who, if anyone, is monitoring these transforming um, pumping regimes it, for their effects on springs along the shores of Pu'uloa, both in terms of quality and quantity? Um, hi, Jonathan. I, I don't know the, the question answer to that. Uh, uh, and I also uh, grew up uh, uh, on the shores of Pu'uloa uh, in Waipahu, uh, but um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, things are moving around. Okay, there is another question from Cliff Foss. Um, and I'm not sure if you answered it or addressed this already, but I'll ask and you choose. Um, some of the spills happened tens of years ago. The lava shaft has been pumping continuously for a long time. So wouldn't the fuel contamination have already reached there by now from previous spills? And why the extra care this time by shutting it down? That's a good question. Uh, I think this time, you know, the, the location is, uh, the leak occurred, uh, the earlier leak was tank number five uh, in 2014, at least that we're aware of. But the recent leak was at tank 20 toward the northern end of the facility. And we think there, you know, there's the potential for a, a northerly flow there. Uh, and also the contamination of the aquifer occurred even a half a mile away at Red Hill Shaft, uh, which is closer to being uh, the other side of the valley. So, uh, so this time we're really taking a precaution. And the other thing that is different, Cliff, I witnessed firsthand the impact of jet fuel contaminated water being served to people in their homes and the impact they had on their families, on their lives. It, it was a terrible thing. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Lisa Martin about gray water reuse. Um, her perception is that I, I thought gray water reuse was illegal on Oahu um, relating to individual properties using their own gray water, um, not centrally treated wastewater. How can we change that? And I, I'm assuming, I'm gonna interpret your question as, um, how can we make better use of gray water on individual properties on the island of Oahu. I, I wish uh, Barry Usaga was here for my water resources. Uh, he'd be able to get the answer right out on that. Uh, I'm not as familiar, but I think there is uh, discussions with the Department of Health that we were participating in and also changes to the, I think to the plumbing code uh, that is uh, gonna allow uh, more of this uh, to happen okay. you know, easily. But, yeah, she clarified, I misinterpreted her question. She is interested in how to, how to change the law that makes gray water use illegal. So you said it would be in the plumbing code. Uh, Representative Martin, you know, we can read, please uh, reach out to us, uh, send me an email uh, and, uh, or Kathleen an email and we can follow up with you uh, and, and give you a better understanding of uh, where the discussions are on uh, gray water reuse in buildings. Great. Um, uh, okay, Dayananda Vitananj, um, I apologize if I've mispronounced your name, asks, what is the potential impact on water costs if Board of Water Supply has to get 10% of its water through desalination? Wow, 10%, that's, uh, 
uh, on an average day basis, that will be like 14.5 MGV. Uh, the plant we're looking at is about 1.7 with an ability to expand it at five. Uh, we'd have to evaluate the cost because uh, I think uh, the point she's trying to raise is really the desalinated seawater is very expensive water. Uh, the cheapest water is really groundwater, drilling a well, tapping in an aquifer, and at most maybe having to chlorinate the water before we send it to our customers. That is the cheapest cost per gallon uh, and probably the lowest energy use, except for our tunnel sources, which don't need energy to flow. Um, but we'd have to evaluate the, that if we have to go down that road uh, on how we have to pay for it. Because Board of Water Supply, we're financially uh, self-sufficient. Uh, we don't get any property tax revenue. Uh, we, we basically operate and maintain and improve the water system based on people paying their water bills and paying uh, various charges related to the, to the water service. There was a question from Kim Okini Oliveira. Um, when we talk about flushing, quote unquote, flushing the systems, are we saying water is being discharged into near shore offshore environments? If so, is there a working group established on monitoring the potential effects of this? Uh, again, I, you know, we weren't uh, involved in that. I, I think this relates to the actions the, the Navy took in response to the fuel uh, contamination crisis. Uh, that might be a good one to say for the Department of Health uh, next month. James Wolbrink asks, uh, and I, I'm going to wrap it up. Maybe there's this and one more question, but James Wolbrink asks, does the state opening up for travel cause an, cause an increase uh, in 2022 over 20? 21. I, I think it relates to water demand. So has the change in travel um, produced um, a change in water demand that you've seen since the uh, pandemic? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to tease that out from the data. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, weather is really the one of the biggest factors uh, that causes water demand to vary. Uh, but when we looked at uh, I, can, I know the experience from the pandemic, uh, March 20, 2020, uh, when tourism was shut down uh, in Waikiki itself, I think we saw the water demand drop by like 3 million gallons a day less. They still have to use water because they have large uh, buildings and landscaping and facilities that still requires water use, but, less, uh, but no visitors in them. Uh, and the workers that worked in Waikiki now we're, we're back at home sheltering in place. Uh, so we saw actually water demand kind of redistribute to other areas. Uh, we saw a temporary dip in water demand island wide, but then we saw water demand kind of come back uh, to more normal conditions uh, pretty rapidly. So the increase in tourism, it's gonna be hard to say. Uh, I, definitely tourists coming to our island, they consume water, uh, they use water. Uh, so, you know, but it's going to be really hard to figure out how much they use, additional they use. We could go property by property and look at uh, occupancy and water usage property by property and something that might be something we'll look at. Okay, and this is the last question. I apologize to those who had, uh, whose questions went unanswered, but uh, maybe Pat, you can leave uh, contact emails for follow up in the chat. Um, Arlene Velasco asks, do you know if an emergency task force has been formed by your local government to deal with the potential of a water shortage in the summer? Are there any world specialists being hired to pursue solutions that might be used if we cannot meet the daily water needs? Uh, we, you know, we are, um, we are you know, looking at options and experiences from other states to, uh, you know, we have a consultant that's very familiar with uh, California's experience when California has been in prolonged drought uh, to uh, come look at their ideas of what worked uh, uh, for the, those uh, communities and see if that, some of that could be applied here. Uh, but we're, we're not at this point hiring an expert. Uh, I am considering though uh, creation of a special uh, advisory group 
of different stakeholders uh, that have a very important uh, concern or uh, related to uh, availability of water and water restrictions that might uh, come into effect. So uh, I'm thinking about considering uh, establishing a formally a stakeholder, stakeholder group uh, related to this Red Hill situation that could help give us uh, advice and thoughts and feedback on various approaches that we might take. But uh, I do want to add my thanks to Ernie Lau and Erwin Kawata for all that you do uh, to, to guide us and to help protect, um, protect our, our water supply. Uh, and thank you very much for taking time out at this uh, really busy time to share your, uh, your knowledge with us, with all of us. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in for this important seminar and hope to see you in our future seminars. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. Be safe. Thank you.